It's not until the fourth book of Paradise Lost that we see, finally, we see represented before us the paradise whose imminent loss is, is heralded so grandly in the poem's title. And, and Milton's task here is a difficult one. His task is to, is to represent unfallen Eden, Eden before the fall, to represent this unfallen Eden to a fallen audience of the 1660s from his own perspective as a fallen, as a fallen man himself, as a fallen poet. And, and Milton is continually confronting, is self-conscious about this predicament and continually confronting the challenge posed by this essentially artistic predicament. Um, but the predicament is not simply, although it is this, not simply an epistemological quandary, um, a problem about knowledge. How can fallen man know anything about unfallen man? There, there's, there's more writing on this question than merely the, uh, this, this question of how can we possibly know what it was like in this unknowable state before the fall. And it's, it's more important than simply that because everything is riding on Milton's success uh, of, of his representation of, of an unfallen Eden. I think the theodicy, the success of Milton's attempt to justify the ways of God to men is hanging to, uh, to some degree on the success of his representation of unfallenness. And, and this is why. Because only if we can truly see paradise as unfallen can we really believe that Adam and Eve were in fact perfectly capable of exercising their unfallen wills freely when confronted with the temptation of the, of the fruit. So even so much as a hint of, of fallenness in a representation of Eden threatens to, threatens to indict God, threatens to impugn God's justice. And because God can be said to have caused the fall, if, if he can be seen to have insinuated into paradise even the slightest propensity to, to fallenness, um, uh, this, the, the question is an important one. So to justify fully the ways of God that this fallen poet has to represent to us, the fallen audience, an Eden that is unmistakably unfallen. It's a, it's a, it's a huge challenge. Um, and, and, and though un, unfallen Eden, Eden can't be like anything we know, um, it, it, it has to be other, uh, utterly other from everything that we're familiar with because, of course, everything that we're familiar with is fallen. And so one of the dominant rhetorical strategies of the first two books has to be inverted to some degree in, in book four. Um, we have spent some time talking about the similes, especially the similes at the beginning of Milton's poem. And the simile used uh, initially um, in, in Paradise Lost is at some important junctures in book four especially, is transformed into what we can think of as a dissimile. I'm not actually sure that that's a real rhetorical term. Um, I didn't make it up, but in any case, we'll, we'll, we'll use it for, for lack, of a better, uh, lack of a better word. Um, so a simile, a positive simile involves the construction, you know what this is like. It involves a construction that X is like Y. And a dissimile would propose the opposite, that X is unlike why? And so I'm going to ask you to turn uh, to the most famous of these dissimiles in Paradise Lost. This is at line 268 of Book 4. Um, it's page 283 and 284 in the Hughes. And Milton is forced to describe, what else can he do? He's forced to describe Paradise in terms of all the things that Eden is not. So he tells us, not that fair field of Enna, nor that sweet grove of Daphne by Orontes, nor that Nicaean Isle, I'm, I'm skipping here, obviously, and, and, and so forth. It's quite a catalog of things that Eden is not like. And the rhetorical mode is necessarily one of, uh, of negation because of the epistemological and artistic problem of, of the fallen representation of unfallenness. Look, um, look a little further up at line 233. This is, I think, where the problem of a, of a fallen representation of an unfallen state actually really comes to a head. Milton's describing here the four rivers of Eden. Uh, line 233, and now divided into four main streams, run diverse, wandering many a famous realm and country whereof here needs no account, but rather to tell, if art could tell, how from that sapphire fount the crisped brooks Rolling on orient pearl and sands of gold, 
with mazy error under pendant shades ran nectar, visiting each plant and fed flowers worthy of paradise, which not nice art in beds and curious knots, but nature boon poured forth profuse on hill and dale and plain. The flowers of paradise are poured forth in Eden, not by a nice or a, or a fastidious uh, a gardener, by fastidious artifice. Um, th there's, there's nothing fussy about this garden. It's bounteous nature herself who has poured forth all this profuseness. Eden is free of, of any artifice. And, but this lack of art in Eden, of course, only accentuates the problem that the, the poet has no choice but to face. Um, the, the poet is under a pressure to describe with a, what is, of course, his poetic art, that which is essentially indescribable. And, and, and Milton lets us know the problem, if art could tell. And that phrase, if art could tell, clearly implies that art, even Milton's art, uh, can't tell us what Eden was like. That, that Milton's art can't represent an unfallen, non-artificial world with the instruments, the tools of fallen artificial language. And the, the, the impossibility that he's facing, I think, is nowhere so uh, apparent as it is here in this description of the crisped brooks of paradise, rolling with mazy error under pendant shades. Now, uh, of course, error is uh, one of the most reson resonant words in the entire poem. Um, error is the moral category, or that we can think of it as the theological category most often applied to the fall and to Adam and Eve's eventual sin. And we might very well wonder why it is that error has, has, has crept into Eden before the fall. Its presence here on some level could be seen to doom the garden in advance, could be seen as some kind of evidence of a, a, of a degree of fallenness in this unfallen Eden. But Milton, of course, is using the word error in a special sense. And, 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 he do, and, he, and he's doing what he does so often. He's, he employs a word solely to evoke its etymological root sense, uh, which in this case simply means wandering. The, the brook here is quite simply not flowing straight. It's, it's, it's moving, it's, it's divigating, it's moving in a, in a, in a cur curvaceous form. A and Milton is working consciously to exclude the, the moral significance that this word error had acquired later in its, in its etymological history. Um, he's attempting to block out the meaning of this word that had crept in, as it were, after the fall. Um, there's actually a, a, a wonderful book that looks uh, brilliantly at just this phenomenon. It's called Milton's Grand Style um, by, by the great critic Christopher Ricks. Um, and, 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 and in that book, Ricks argues for the, the self-consciousness behind Milton's employment of the original uh, etymological sense of some of the most loaded words in the, in the poem. And so Milton will remind us of the fall with his use of such a word as, as error. But at the, at the same time, of course, he's attempting to create in us, and, and it's a remarkable move, to create in us a memory for a time in which a word like error had not yet been infected by its morally pejorative modern connotation. He's reminding us of a time in which there was no such thing as moral error. Not that we can be reminded, because of course we can't remember, we weren't around. But it's as if uh, a memory is being um, instilled in us by means of Milton's poetry. Um, he, he condenses into a single word what is essentially the entire poetic problem besetting the description of uh, of unfallen Eden. Milton, too, manages, with a word like this, to remind us that we're only seeing the garden after Satan has overleaped its boundaries and, is in, and has begun sneaking around. Um, we're given no description, you'll, you'll note, we're given no description of Eden until after the point in the story in which Satan has already entered uh, or, or crossed the, the, the boundaries of paradise. Look at uh, line 285, this is page 285 in the Hughes. Milton locates that geographical spot on the globe uh, believed to have been Eden. But he does that only to remind us that everything that we're seeing is precisely what Satan is seeing. Um, where the fiend saw undelighted all delight, all kind of creatures new to sight and strange. 
And Satan's presence is, is important here because he reminds us that we too, um, are, we're, in a, we're in a position of seeing undelighted all delight. We share his pained alienation um, of, from, the, from the innocence of the garden. And, and nowhere is the problem of representation more urgent and more troubled than in the first view that we are given of, of Adam and Eve. There is uh, an extraordinary pressure on Milton as he describes the condition of the unfallen Adam and Eve. And, and, and that pressure would unquestionably, I think, have been felt by the poem's original, uh, or original readers. Milton's description of Adam and Eve, and in this respect, it is like what I take to be nearly every 17th century description of Adam and Eve. It's, it, it is necessarily a political statement. It's an account of the first, it's the account of the first society. And as an account of the first society, Milton's Eden has to establish something like the ideal against which all current, all fallen societies have to be judged. Um, so in the 17th century, a, dis a description of man in the state of nature before the onset of any kind of civil government was an essential component, component of about, just about any political philosophy. You couldn't, you couldn't forward a political vision without forwarding at the same time an image of a society before the onset of government. And the most important political philosopher of mid-17th century England um, is Milton's slightly older contemporary, Thomas Hobbes. And he had founded his vision of politics, which was uh, a decidedly authoritarian vision of politics, on just such an account of a nearly unrecoverable, an unrememberable past. And so in, in Hobbes's Leviathan, um, Hobbes conjures an image of the original, the original man in the state of nature that serves as the foundation for his uh, political wisdom, for his truly outrageous thesis that the only viable political institution is that of an absolutist monarchy. And I say it's, it's, uh, I say it's outrageous, perhaps because it's so incredibly compelling. Um, you, you almost, uh, it's, it's very hard not to be converted to uh, a terrifying form of authoritarianism when you, when you read Hobbes' ironclad uh, prose. So in the famous chapter 13 of the first book of Leviathan, this was in the, in the packet, Hobbes describes the riotous mayhem constitutive of life before the onset of political institutions. And so uh, in interestingly and importantly here, Hobbes is forwarding a kind of secular argument. This isn't theological, and so he doesn't return us to the Genesis account of Adam and Eve. Um, his is the state of nature, he tells us, it's just like the one inhabited, it's, it's, it's America. Um, it's the one inhabited by the savages of, of, of the Americas. But the, purposes, uh, the purpose of the Hobbesian account is directly analogous, I think, to Milton's purpose in describing Eden. For Hobbes, uh, men in the state of nature are all equal. The state of nature is an egalitarian one. And, and, and Hobbes does everything he can do. I mean, it, it's e egalitarian even with respect to sex. And, and Hobbes does everything he can do to demonstrate the dangers of this natural egalitarianism. Because, uh, because Hobbes tells us, all men and women are, were created equal, there's no authority to keep them in place. There's no, there's no authority to keep them from what would naturally just be a perpetual state of strife. And so, uh, and so Hobbes, Hobbes explains in chapter 13, without a common power, and by common power he means a king, a prince, a tyrant, it doesn't matter, someone. Uh, without a common power, man is in the state of war, and such a war is as, is, as is of every man against every man. And he continues, and the life of the natural man, and this is surely the most famous and the most glorious sentence in all of Hobbes' remarkable Leviathan, and the life of the natural man is solitary, poor, nas nasty, brutish, and short. And so for Hobbes, the egalitarianism established in nature is, is obviously unsatisfactory. It has to be corrected. And so we have to construct some kind of governmental structure, a polity, where wh whereby we submit ourselves to an absolute ruler, a monarch or a tyrant. It doesn't matter. And Hobbes' Leviathan must have been deeply troubling to Milton, um, who devoted so much of his career to the critique of just the kind of absolutist government that Hobbes is championing. And, and, and I think there, there are a lot of signs in Paradise Lost that Milton is countering his great contemporary, Thomas Hobbes. 
Now, one of the advantages of writing about, about Eden was that a description of paradise, as I've suggested, was uh, something like an implicit model for a political philosophy. It's certainly in Milton's hands. And so Hobbes had used his description of the, f the state of men in the state of nature to forward his, his authoritarianism. And, and so Milton has to use his description of the first couple to forward his cause, which is essentially that of republicanism or some kind of non-monarchic government. And Adam and Eve have to form, they have to be able to form a successful society alone a successful polity on their own without the dictatorial intervention of any sovereign power. This is crucial for, 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 for what Milton needs to be able to argue politically. So what exactly are Milton's politics? It's been a while since we've visited this topic. Um, we, we, haven't, we haven't really discussed Milton's politics since we looked at the 1644 Areopagitica. And a lot, I'm sad to say, has changed since then. In Areopagitica, we saw Milton affirm what was essentially the general equality of all human beings. Uh, this was an implicit argument that all individuals have been endowed by God with reason and that they are all equally capable of choosing and reasoning for themselves. But in the 1650s, Milton had grown considerably less optimistic um, in his sense of the equality of, of all men and women. The average individual in England for Milton at this point, didn't in fact seem to be endowed with quite as much reason and capacity for rational choice as Milton felt that he was capable of, or, or as Milton felt that he and his fellow Puritan revolutionaries um, were, were capable of. So many of Milton's backsliding countrymen wanted their king back. A devastating uh, cultural fact for Milton. And so Milton began to develop something, a, a, a new political philosophy, and it's something like an aristocratic philosophy of political society that places superior, more rational, more spiritually minded beings, people like John Milton, um, at the top of the society, and they um, are necessarily above less rational, less excellent, uh, less spiritually minded beings who are obviously um, a in a lower stratum. And so Milton. Milton's later political philosophy sketches something like an almost a natural hierarchy in which the rational elite are in a position to guide and to, uh, to offer some sort of authoritative wisdom to uh, the, the less rational members of the society. And these less rational members ideally willingly, willingly yield to the superior wisdom and the reason of the rational elite. It would, it, and it seems to be this later vision of a kind of naturally hierarchical society that forms the basis for the first polity, which is that of Adam and Eve in Milton's Eden. And it goes without saying, the union of Adam and Eve in Milton's Paradise is a, is a patriarchal one. And the hierarchical division between superior and inferior creatures um, has been marked almost entirely or exclusively along the lines of gender. Now, M Milton, as you know, has been reviled for his unrepentant patriarchalization of the first couple. Um, he, 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 look at line 299, one of the most famous lines in the poem. Um, this is the middle of page 285 of the Hughes. Milton's talking about uh, the purpose of Adam and Eve's creation. He for God only, she for God in him. It, this, is, uh, th this is without question. Uh, a, a, sexist, a sexist vision of the first polity. We can say that, I think, without much hesitation. But it would be almost criminal, and I really believe this, to say that Milton's sexism is simplistic. Um, it is so complex, in fact, that, that Milton has included in his poem um, a number of competing ways to think about this, this first society. And we actually have passionately expressed before us in Paradise Lost, um, the old Milton, the younger, much more liberal Milton, that radical egalitarianism that he was able so forcefully and compellingly to voice in Areopagitica. That voice is audible in Paradise Lost. But we also, of course, have the later Milton, the believer in a hierarchical society. And, and you can hear this, these contradictions at work in the poem's description of this first polity, the, the union of Adam and Eve. So look a little further up on page 285, this is line 288. 
two of far nobler shape, erect and tall, godlike erect with native honor clad in naked majesty, seemed lords of all. And worthy seemed, for in their looks divine, the image of their glorious maker shone, truth, wisdom, sanctitude severe and pure, severe but in true filial freedom placed, whence, truth, whence true authority in men. Now, I, it, it certainly strikes me to be the case that this first view that we get of Adam and Eve is an egalitarian one. They are both, in their naked majesty, they are both described as lords of all. But their, but, but their seeming equality is, is, a, is a source of no small anxiety to Milton. And so we are told almost immediately, he can't take it anymore. Um, we're, we're told, though both not equal, as their sex not equal seemed. Well, of course, up to this point, their sex did equal seem. And, and it's here that Milton places a, a, an enormous amount of weight on this word seemed, one of the most important words in book four. Seemed, seemed, seemed not equal to whom? The idea of seeming is always with respect to a perceiver, um, someone to whom something seems to be this or that. And it's with this word seemed that we're reintroduced to the subject of the fallen perspective on an unfallen scene, and reminded that we are not granted anything like a purview of Eden until after Sat Satan has, has entered the garden. And, and, and in book, f this description of Eden in book four has in fact merely been tracing Satan's steps. A and this description of Adam and Eve merely emerges now because this is the scene that Satan happens now to be looking at. I'll look at line 285. I've already, I've already referred to these lines. Where the fiend saw undelighted all delight, all kind of living creatures, new to sight and strange. And then you have a colon. And then after the colon falls this long description of Adam and Eve. And it's possible, it's just possible, <laughs> to read the entire description of the sexually hierarchized Adam and Eve as an account, as an account in something like indirect discourse of Satan's fallen perspective. If their sex not equal seemed, it's possible that their sex not equal seemed to Satan. And, it, and it's Satan, of course, we know this already to be the case, who is more concerned than any of the other poem's characters with problems of inequality. So this is, this is naturally uh, going to be the predisposition set of concerns that he brings to his vision of any polity. There's, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's a fascinating question, and there's actually a, a, a considerable debate uh, raging, uh, if, we can, if you can say that a, a, a Miltonist rage, but if, uh, there's, a, there's a debate among Miltonists on just this question, and it's an interesting one. Milton's position at the head of the English literary canon is often associated, or has been since the late 70s, with his insistent positioning, or maybe actually since Virginia Woolf was writing in the 20s and 30s is often associated with his insistent positioning of Adam over Eve in, in Paradise Lost. And so some participants in the debates about the, 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 the validity of the Western literary canon have imagined the effects of sexism, sexism in our society, um, have imagined eradicating sexis, sexism in our society by eradicating from college reading lists um, a sexist poet li like, like Milton. That argument is made, it's still forwarded today, and it's an argument that poses, as you can imagine, it poses an understandable threat to, uh, to people like me, admirers of this poet. And you can imagine the number of Miltonists, it was really quite remarkable, who rallied around the textual suggestion that, that when Milton says he forgot only, she forgot in him, he doesn't really mean it. Uh, this was the, uh, I think it was in the mid-80s that a critic First, <laughs> first hit on the theory that all of the description of Adam and Eve could be seen as, uh, as merely uh, an exfoliation of, the, of Satan's perspective. And there was a, a tremendous joy and excitement in the, Miltonic, in the Milton community um, once that idea had been, had been floated. Um, it's as if the narrator is just re reproducing for us the hierarchical imagination of Satan, whose perspective on Adam and Eve is the one that we're getting at the moment. And so we're able to say to ourselves rather comfortably and complacently that Milton isn't telling us that, uh, that, that, that the uh, social organization of Eden is sexist. Milton is telling us that Satan 
is sexist and that patriarchy is essentially satanic rather than Miltonic. Um, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a depressing, I, I get depressed when I think of um, positions, critical positions like this. Um, whether you have the extreme position of Milton as the inventor and the prime perpetrator of misogyny on the one hand, or the counter vision of Milton as an early feminist on, on, on the other. Um, the case is obviously more complicated than that, and it's more interesting than that, because it's not at all clear, in the, in just in the passage that we're looking at, it's not clear whose voice is actually authorizing uh, these lines that establish the patriarchal pr parameters of unfallen society. With, w without a doubt, we have uh, the narrator speaking here, and presumably he is representing something like the official line of the poem, uh, but Milton does, in fact, go out of his way to situate the entire scene as an elaboration of Satan's perspective. Both of these things are true. And this pa passage, which has absolutely everything to do with, the establish with what Milton calls establishing the true authority of men, this passage refuses to establish its own authority. It refuses to announce itself as the product either of, of, of the poem's narrator or, or, or of Satan. And, and, and this... It's a, it's, a, it's a moment of textual instability, and it reflects the larger, I think it re reflects the larger political instability that is threatening Eden, threatening the relationship, the relation between Adam and Eve. And so it's worth asking ourselves, what, 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 what is it about Adam and Eve that makes them seem unequal? Look at line 297. For contemplation he and valor formed, for softness she and sweet, attractive grace. Now, how do we, how do we know this? Uh, we know it by their physical differences. Uh, we know it by the appearance of their anatomies. And more precisely than that, we know that they are different and unequal um, by means of our perception of their hair. His fair, large front and eye sublime declare absolute rule. And hyacinthine locks round from his parted forelock manly hung, clustering, but not beneath his shoulders broad. <laughs> um, Milton did wear his uh, hair long, but he wants us to know that's, that's, that's part of the historical record, and he was very pleased with that. Um, but he, wants to, he always wants us to know that it wasn't too long, and this, it's the same with Adam, who wears his hair unusually long, but not indecorously long. Um, Round from his parted forelock, manly hung clustering, but not beneath his shoulders broad. She, as a veil, down to the slender waist, her unadorned golden tresses wore disheveled, but in wanton ringlets waved as the vine curls her tendrils, which implied subjection. Now, I, I, I'll, 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 I'll bet that we can all agree that a description of their hair is not what we were expecting at this moment. Um, supporters of patriarchy or of uh, the sexual supe the, the superiority of men have always enlisted anatomical di differences, uh, the anatomical differences between the sexes as proof of, of man's rightful, uh, rightful ability to subject or subordinate woman. And a fact central to the patriarchal prejudice, as you can imagine, was the strength, what it's often seems to be the strength differential between men and women. And so if Milton had imagined a cosmos that privileged physical strength, then I think we would have no choice but glumly to accept the fact that Adam is indeed superior to Eve. And you could imagine how an argument like this uh, could, could have played out in the pages of Paradise Lost. If, uh, if Milton could easily have argued that human excellence could be determined um, by the sheer number of shrubs that Adam and Eve were able to prune on any given day. And so in, in, in such a world, um, Adam would be able to prove his superiority. Um, but physical strength, and this is important, means absolutely nothing in Paradise Lost. And in fact, if anything, Milton is always denigrating the importance of physical strength. So why, okay, given that, <laughs> we still have to ask the question, why try to argue for the inequality of the sexes on the basis of hair length? Um, you, uh, I, I presume that none of you um, have had children, but you probably still know nonetheless that men and women or boys and girls are not born with distinct or distinguishable heads of hair. Um, 
at least until male pattern baldness sets in, um, uh, the, the, he the, the hair of men and women aren't distinct or distinguishable. And if anything, male pattern baldness simply gives women an edge. And if Milton wanted to use hair as a natural sign of sexual difference, he should be discussing, I would think, he should be discussing facial hair. Adam's superiority um, presumably could be evinced by his commanding beard. We could imagine Milton doing that, something that Eve lacks by virtue of her anatomy. But the hair on the head, this doesn't make any sense. The hair on the head is, in fact, one of the few anatomical <laughs> features that is absolutely gender neutral. Our hair is gendered by virtue of the barber, not by virtue of the creator. Which brings us to this fact, um, which we all know, the obvious, and w which is what every obstetrician knows, the obvious distinguishing anatomical characteristic is genitalia. Um, and, and Milton actually does mention Adam and Eve's mysterious parts, but, but he mentions them only to, to dis dismiss their difference. Um, he may be gesturing towards something like, you'll tell me if this is crazy, uh, something like a genital difference when he describes Adam's hair, his locks manly hung clustering. I don't think that holds. The, the sexual signifier that hangs manly off of Adam's body and that signifier which has traditionally, of course, been invoked as a sign of sexual superiority is Adam's penis. But Milton alludes to this genital signifier of difference, their mysterious parts, only to dismiss it. He chooses instead for the distinguishing characteristic of the sexes, a phenomenon that's rooted not in nature but in culture, hair length. Like, like Hobbes, Milton is under a, a tremendous cultural pressure in, when he describes the earliest state of nature. Um, the, the description of nature has to bear the weight of all of the social and all of the political claims that the poem makes. And the set of social conditions that, that Milton has to justify and make seem natural is, is a particularly tricky one. Both Eve and Adam have to be seen as absolutely free. Each of them has to be capable of exercising reason and making uh, reasonable, rational decisions. And, and in this sense, Adam, enjoy, Adam and Eve enjoy something like the absolutely egalitarian world, the structure of the political world that we had seen in the, a treatise like Areopagitica. Milton at his most exuberantly liberal. But while Adam and, Inge and Eve enjoy all the rights of an egalitarian society, as they do, I think, in Paradise Lost, they are not, therefore, equal. Adam appears to be superior to Eve. And Milton will only tell us that he appears such. The, the, the narrator cannot make this, uh, make this claim in anything like a more declarative sense. And so on the basis of at least, uh, at least of their appearances, the social formation in Eden is strictly hierarchical. A and on some extraordinary level, this poem is trying to have it both ways. A and so much of the energy of the account of paradise derives from Milton's contradictory account of the political structure of Eden. He applies to the Edenic society of Adam and Eve what I take to be two irreconcilable modes of social governance. Eden is once egalitarian. Its inhabitants are, are entire, they're na in naked majesty, they're lords of all, both of them. Uh, Adam and Eve are entirely free and self-determining. But at the same time, Eden is structured as a, as a kind of aristocracy, where the male class is deemed categorically, genetically superior to the female class. And without, it, it goes without saying that the situation is untenable. The contradictory social formation of paradise is inherently unstable, and I'm convinced that nothing is more important in our understanding of the dynamics of the fall than, this, than these principles. The principle that Eve is absolutely free and equally rational, equally capable of rational and virtuous choices, but also the conflicting principle that Eve is to some extent subject to Adam's, uh, Adam's authority. And the contradictory political impulses in the poem are, are, are brilliantly worked out in the first description of Adam and Eve. Look at, look at line 307. This is unbelievable. Um, look at what Milton is able to establish by way of a description of Eve's hair. It's here, in a representation of her hair, that the nature of the Edenic polity is established. So Eve's golden tresses waved as the vine curls her tendrils, which implied subjection. 
but required with gentle sway, and by her yielded, by him best received, yielded with coy submission, modest pride, and isn't this a beautiful line, and sweet, reluctant, amorous delay. The, the conflicting politics of Eden are, are, are best captured in the, in the, in, in the, in, by means of the rhetorical strategy of oxymoron, or the, or the contradiction in terms. Milton packs this description of the first couples. This is essentially a kind of erotic play that's being described before us, and it's packed with oxymoronic descriptions. Um, and, and Milton's trying to communicate the incredibly delicate political balance of this hierarchical society. Um, this society may be hierarchical, Milton is telling us, but it's not authoritarian. Eve may be subject to Adam, who holds authority over Eve, but, but, but her subjection, because she's free, her subjection is required with a gentle sway. And no sooner has Adam exercised his authority by gently swaying Eve, then she willingly yields to him, exercising her free capacity for, for consent, her capacity to choose to be swayed by her superior. So Eve's hair, hair seems to imply subjection, but Eve's hair also seems to imply freedom and a kind of resistance to subjection. Eve yields not with submission. Milton would never permit himself to say that. Uh, Eve yields with a coy submission. She holds something back even as she grants it. And we have detailed before us the endless give and take that this delicate political structure requires. And, and, and for Milton, this give and take is not only the basis of a society, it's the basis as well for, 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 for eros, for, or, or sexual, uh, sexual pleasure. Uh, with that, that extraordinary phrase, sweet, reluctant, amorous delay. Mil Milton's able to pack into three adjectives and one noun the pleasure derivable by both parties in Eve's exercise of resistance. Uh, but, but Eve's coyness is, isn't just sexy for Milton, it's also politically meaningful. And from a political perspective, her capacity for a kind of reluctance and resistance serves as a guarantee for her capacity for a kind of rational consent. And, and, and it's also theologically uh, resonant. From a theological perspective, Eve's willingness to resist, to delay, constitutes a guarantee of her divinely granted free will. It, Eve cannot be forced to do anything. And it's as if in this little dance that they perform in the quotidian life of, of unfallen Eden, um, Eve is practicing in a small way for that crucial moment at the temptation in which her ability to resist and delay will, will mean the difference between life and death. Now we as readers find it difficult, I think, we should at least find it difficult to found a theory of hierarchy on something so fragile and so easily alterable. You can tell I've just, I, I just had a haircut yesterday. So easily alterable as, as hair length. But what's even more amazing than that is that the fact that the nature of the gendered hierarchy of Adam and Eve isn't even evident to Adam and Eve themselves. Uh, this blows me away. Look at, look at Eve's first memory in Paradise Lost. This is uh, line 477, page 289 in the Hughes. Eve is far from being able to recognize Adam's superiority immediately. And for Eve, there's certainly nothing in the length of his hair that, that suggests that he might enjoy a kind of authority over her. Um, and in fact, to Eve, Adam seems to be a noticeably inferior creature when she compares him to that image of herself, that beautiful and responsive image to her, of herself that she had found in the pool. This is line 477. Till I, she tells Adam, till I espied thee, fair indeed and tall, she, <laughs> she grants him that he's tall, under a platen, yet methought less fair less winning soft, less amiably mild than that sm smooth, watery image. It's like, the, it's like the dissimile of the fair fields of Enna. Adam can only be understood by what it is he lacks. And, and indeed, it's a lack of anything like a natural or self-evident sexual hierarchy that constitutes one of the central problems in, in Paradise Lost. Hierarchy is not a natural fact in, in Paradise. It's an arbitrarily imposed social institution. 
It's been imposed by God, but it's, it hasn't been built into the structure of the natural world. And it's to Milton's great credit, and I really mean this, uh, I mean this with the utmost seriousness, that he labors to expose the artificial cultural origins of the sexual subjection that at the same time he is championing and celebrating. Eve has to be told that Adam is her superior and she has to be undergo a, 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 an elaborate process and a complicated process of, of cultural indoctrination. And, and nowhere in the description of Eden are we reminded more forcefully of our incapacity to understand unfallen nature than in Milton's description of Eve's hair. Her unadorned golden tresses wore disheveled, but in wanton ringlets waved. Uh, disheveled and wanton, of course, these seem like extraordinarily prejudicial adjectives, and they cast a moral judgment, it has seemed, to readers from the very beginning. They cast a moral judgment on her uh, long before she has sinned. But once again, Milton is playing with etymology, and I think this is Rick's point. Disheveled is being used here in its original literal sense. It literally means hair let down. And, and the ringlets, she's not wearing a, a bun. And the ringlets are wanton in, th in that they are simply unrestrained. And, and the fact that we're so eager as readers to supply a kind of loose or sexual meaning to these words implicates us, Milton perhaps seems to be saying. It, and it implicates, of course, Satan as well in the fallen perspective on the ultimate, ultimately mysterious union of Adam and Eve. We are eyeing them askance and leering at them just as Satan is. And, and it's Stanley Fish's argument, and it's not unconvincing, that Milton's purpose in employing these loaded adjectives is to force the reader to acknowledge her own, her own fallenness, um, to remind us all of the inadequacy of our fallen perspective on, on this unfallen nature. So we're wrong to import a kind of moral prejudice to the words disheveled and wanton, but Milton will push it even further. Um, Eve's hair is also waving and insinuating, and in its waving curly motions, it resembles nothing so much as that other, much less noble creature in the garden. And that's, um, that's of course, the serpent. Look at line 345. This is where Milton describes the elephant and the serpent. And I don't have time to comment it. I just want to say, what an amazing adjective the unwieldy elephant. The unwieldy elephant to make the mirth used all his might and wreathed his, his lithe proboscis. Close the serpent sly insinuating wove with Gordian twine his braided train. The braided train of the serpent's waving motion resembles nothing so much as the waving braids of Eve's hair. And Eve seems to be associated well in advance of the actual temptation with the sly insinuations of the serpent, an association that, of course, can only damage any sense that we have of her unfallen reason and her, her genuine free will. But Milton carefully includes in this description another example of a waving and insinuating motion in Eden, and that's the elephant's proboscis. He's prefaced his connection between Eve and Satan here. Um, with the, with, the, with, the, with the inclusion of the elephant. He wants us to know, with this image of the elephant's light proboscis, that the motion of waving and weaving and wreathing and insinuating are still, in fact, entirely innocent. And it will be only be Satan's subsequent actions that infect them retro, retroactively, infect them for us. And, and the problem being exposed, once again, is the problem of representation. How can you represent an unfallen state from a fallen perspective. Okay, um, look at your, the handout. And if you don't have a handout, um, try to get one from the corners of the room. Uh, at this, this representation of Adam and Eve was made in 1638. Um, so we're, this is, this Rembrandt uh, did this drawing uh, shortly before Milton was beginning to think of Paradise Lost. And in the Rembrandt representation, we have, I think, a, this is a devastating critique of the 17th century desire to represent an unfallen paradise, what we have Milton trying to do. Like Milton, uh, Rembrandt exposes the impossibility, I think, of, of such a representation. Uh, if we read the book of Genesis, we know that, that Eve was alone with the serpent. And so we're seeing Adam and Eve in this picture, presumably after Eve has eaten the fruit, but before Adam had eaten it. Now, Adam may not have eaten the fruit, but he certainly, I mean, look at, look at this. He certainly looks 
as fallen as Eve. They're, they are equally physically ugly, it seems to me, and that's indisputable. Uh, nasty, brutish, and short, it's as if they crawled out of the pages of the famous 13th chapter of the first book of Hobbes' Leviathan. Look at Eve's face with its broad, overhanging brow <laughs> that looks, um, she suggests the unevolved uh, state of an upper primate more than she does of the glorious and beautiful first human female. And look at Adam. The, the, the presumably unfallen Adam here is writhing in a twisted and guilty posture that gives him no moral superiority, superiority over Eve whatsoever. And, and if anything here, Adam's hair seems more wanton and more disheveled than, than Eve's. Um, I, 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 Rembrandt's Eden seems to be, um, m must be very humid. There's a kind of frizzy split end thing going on uh, with, with, with both of them, and especially with Eve, but at least it's falling rather neatly over her head, which can't be said of Adam. And, and of course, the primary clue that this representation of Eden um, is imposing upon uh, unfallen Adam a sense of fallenness comes from Rembrandt's shading of their genitals. And, and, and actually, in the original, you can, you can make out their genitalia quite, quite distinctly, but they're nonetheless shaded, and this is, shaded. This, is, uh, this is important for Rembrandt. They're partially hidden by the dark and guilty shadow produced by the serpent. And the serpent, you may or may not have noticed, is that scaly, hideous creature um, climbing the tree on the right. Uh, Milton had gone out of his way to insist that the genitals of Adam and Eve, their mysterious parts were not concealed. But then he goes on to censure us, his fallen readers, for the sense of guilty shame that we bring to any speculation about their mysterious parts. But Rembrandt is, it's as if Rembrandt's a step ahead of Milton. He's telling us that there can be no such thing as a just representation of unfallen nudity. Our, our darkened minds will continually shade that nudity with the, with the inescapable shadows of guilt and shame that we have no choice but to bring to questions of sexuality. Uh, Rembrandt joins Milton in representing a scene that seems to lie somewhere, both the Eden of Rembrandt and the Eden of Milton seem to lie somewhere between a fallen and an unfallen state. And I think a lot of the energy of the Rembrandt drawing derives from his refusal to depict the, the moral superiority of one sex over the other. There, there's, there, there's no clear demarcation here of a sexual hierarchy or a natural sexual hierarchy. This Adam doesn't seem any physically stronger than Eve. And if he is to be seen as the greater sex, perhaps it's just because he's placed himself arbitrarily in a physical posture of superiority. He's placed one foot slightly on, a, on, a, on an elevated plane. He's trying to get a leg up. Um, he's compensating, perhaps, for his lack of a self-evident authority over Eve. Tradition, of course, has always insisted, and this is the story that we inherit as children, that Eve seduced Adam into eating the fruit. Adam would never have fallen if, Eden, if Eve hadn't tricked him into eating the apple or implored her to join, implored him to join her in her sin. But Rembrandt here is refusing to attribute all of the guilt to Eve. Now Adam may be, it's possible that Adam is here trying to protect Eve from the fruit with his, the gesture of his hand, but he also might be reaching for the fruit, grabbing it, um, it's possible that he's seizing the fruit, just as Milton's Adam seizes Eve when he finds her by the pool. So what I'm saying here is that the suggestion in both Milton and Rembrandt is that the fall has less to do with Eve's seduc seduction of Adam than the more foundational, the structural problem of sexual inequality. Um, the fall starts to look more and more like something, like, like the inevitable consequence of sexual hierarchy. Okay, um, I'm going to conclude after we take one final look at the Rembrandt, at, at one of the visual, at the, the, at the visual details that Milton forces, um, that Rembrandt forces into a kind of analogous relation. And in this, he's like Milton. Like Milton, Rembrandt draws into the relation, into an analogous relation, the slithery length of that awful serpent and the innocent and playful winding of the elephant's proboscis. And you can see the unwieldy elephant in the lower right-hand corner of the Rembrandt drawing. Um, but the, the proboscis and the serpent's tail are not the only snaky things 
in Rembrandt's Eden. As, 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 as I mentioned earlier, in the original drawings, Adam's mysterious part is actually quite visible. It's nasty, it's brutish, it's short, but it's, it's discernible. And it's important that it's discernible. And through this technique of visual juxtaposition, Rembrandt casts an evil and satanic shadow over this part of Adam's anatomy, that distinguishing feature of his sex, which is the arbitrary signifier of his authority over Eve. So Adam's authority here, in its most intimate manifestation, may be as complicit as the serpent in the crime of the fall. Um, so Satan, Satan, sees, Satan sees all of this. He sees this weird and bizarrely unstable sexual hierarchy in Milton's Eden. And what does he say? Uh, line 290, no, line 529, line, five, line 521 at page 290. Um, Milton has Satan announce that he has, Eureka, I know how I'm going to do it. He's arrived at his scheme to destroy Adam and Eve. And he says, just having witnessed all of this, O oh, fair foundation laid whereon to build their ruin. I know how I'm going to be able to bring this place down. Now, Milton isn't eager to join Satan in this claim of God's injustice, but he's willing to, to expose the inherently unstable foundation of Eden's sexual hierarchy. Um, Milton lays the foundation, ultimately, I think, as we'll see when we read Book Nine, he lays the foundation for our understanding of some of the deepest causes of the fall. Okay, remember for next time uh, uh, a big chunk of reading, books five, six, seven, and eight.